Testing, testing. All right. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you now as we have this opportunity to study your word and this very important passage of scripture concerning this great servant of yours who suffered much and often had difficulty understanding why. And that's one reason his story is in your holy word, the Bible. Because suffering, trials, testings, failures, feeling alone, being hurt, disillusioned, is an experience that all of us <coughs> will experience to some degree or another. And it's not the actual experience that's the most important issue to you, although it is important to you. But what's more important is how we respond to the difficult situation. And for that we need your help. For that we need your grace, which of course is available more than we could ever use. So we uh, ask your blessing on this study together. As always, may you be glorified in you alone. And just may your Holy Spirit share with us, teach us, instruct us, correct us, encourage us in whichever way or ways we need today. And again, we pray this all for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We have often said here that we in the leadership of the Inner City Church Planning Mission want to refer to ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ rather than just Christian. Now, nothing wrong with calling yourself a Christian or referring to other Christians as Christians. After all, that's a biblical term. But in the world today, it's quite common for everyone to consider themselves Christians. It's even politically correct in our nation, the United States. But the scriptures really go much further, that doesn't, than just addressing the fact we can say we are a Christian, but do we really possess the Lord Jesus Christ? And that's why to say I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, or that person is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, it adds a lot more weight to the fact that you really do love the Lord and you really do want to follow Him, which also implies obey Him and serve Him. I was so encouraged though, over the last couple of weeks of 2015 where we met in different services, Division Street Fellowship, Butterworth Street Fellowship, and uh, I asked most of you that were here are here now publicly if you would be willing to uh, share what you wanted the Lord to do for you if He allows us to see much at all of 2016. And I was really blessed. Most of you said you wanted spiritual blessing. You wanted spiritual help. You wanted to read the Bible more, maybe. You wanted to pray more. You wanted to witness more. You wanted to attend church more. Whatever it might have been, you said. 
But so it could have been so easy for us to say, well, I want more money, I want you know more fame, I want you know a bigger house, a bigger car. But uh, most of you said you wanted more of the Lord. So that was encouraging to me. You know, I shared earlier before we turned the uh, video camera on how important it is to uh, believe the gospel. So let me just sh share a little bit more detail what I mean there. Uh, the gospel is good news. That's what the word means. And the good news of the gospel is you and I are sinners. We've all broken every one of God's commandments. Did you know that? It says in God's Word, in the book of James, if you break one commandment, you've broken them all. Either literally or in your heart. And in the eyes of God, to break the commandment in your heart is the same as to do it. There's different consequences if you actually can carry out a murder or a theft, obviously. But even to think that, God says, is to do it. And that's why we've all committed murder. We've all stolen. We've all taken God's name in vain. We've all dishonored our parents. We've all committed adultery. And the point of that is, God gave us the law to show us that we were sinners. And hopefully, when we look at that and say, I've broken those, I'm guilty, I deserve judgment, I deserve hell, hopefully, the righteous response is to humble ourselves and say, God, I am guilty. And I deserve hell. But thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to shed his blood, die on the cross, for my payment, for my sins, if I want to go to heaven. You see, if someone dies without knowing Christ, without being a follower of Christ, they have to pay for their sins. In hell. Hell's a real place. Do you believe that? Yep. But if we come to Christ, confess and admit that we failed, broken those commandments, and then we say, Lord, save me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then the Lord gives us a life of Jesus. Because in God's eyes, we have been crucified, buried, and risen again with Jesus, even though we were not there 2,000 years ago. But in God's eyes, we have been. And thus, because He's in heaven, we'll be in heaven. But in the meantime, that salvation, that decision, for me it was September 28, 1977, in a barn out in Byron Center, Michigan, uh, about 10 a.m. in the morning, from that day forward, as I began to read the Bible, hear others preach and teach and get to know other Christians that would come alongside me and, you know, correct me when I needed, uh, so into my life, I began to have a desire to follow Him. That's why we use that phrase, I'm a follower of Christ. Not just a Christian, but I'm a follower of Christ. By the way, Christian does mean follower of Christ. But uh, the term itself, the word itself, has been so watered down in our world. So now, I lead, or try to, by God's grace, lead a life of repentance. A life of repentance. Which means, I'm always repenting. Not to be saved. Once we're saved, we're always saved, right? I mean, God says it's forever. It's eternal. And so, eternal means forever. So even though I fail Him every day, 
I don't have to be born again and again and again and again. All I have to do, as 1 John 1, 9 says, is confess, which means to agree with God that I've sinned, whatever it might be. But a life of repentance, that's, that's being a follower of Christ too. Living your life, living my life, that when I do fail, when I do sin in word, or word, thought, or deed, or attitude, as soon as the Holy Spirit points that out to me, either through reading His Word, hearing a message, or in my conscience, then I say, yes, Lord, I have sinned. Please forgive me. We don't even have to plead with Him. Confess simply means to agree. Now, as you well know, sometimes we sin and we feel so bad about it, which we should, that we, there are tears. There is sorrow. And that's not bad. But uh, you don't have to pay penance. You don't have to do this or do that to receive that forgiveness. All it says is agree with God. So that's the gospel, as I understand it. Simple. But it is profound. It was back on April 28th, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2015, last year, that I was during one of my extended prayer times. And when the weather is nice, like it was nice that day here in uh, Northern United States, for those of you watching in warmer climates. Uh, I like to go to this little lake that's not far from my home. And I have found a secluded place to go where I can spend two or three hours in prayer and really not see much humanity. Once in a while a bike rider will go by, but they won't even see me because I'm secluded. But I'm sitting right on this lake. I love this lake because it's small, but it's quiet. And uh, I can be alone with the Lord and just be 10 minutes from where I live, even in a big city like Grand Rapids. Well, that day I was there. It was a gorgeous day, spring. Sun was shining, nice warm breeze. But the Lord brought my attention to a portion of scripture, and I don't want you to turn there because I have another portion I want to preach on, but uh, it was Psalm 102. You can look it up later if you wish. Psalm 102. And the Lord brought me to that psalm to meditate on me while I was praying and contemplating, as I call it. And I had entitled that psalm on my own years before this title, quote, my life from June 1986 to June 1987. In fact, I'd like to encourage you, if you haven't studied Bible, many of your chapters have been titled by the author of that study Bible or the authors. I would encourage you to make your own titles, especially in the Psalms. This is very... For me, it was very uh, easy to do. Where you read the psalm, you meditate on it, and uh, a theme comes through. A major theme comes through of that one psalm. Maybe it's mercy or grace or you know the forgiveness of God or whatever it might be. Make your own make your own title. Then uh, you have your own study Bible, <laughs> so to speak. Well, I've done that. What 1986. That was uh, 30 years earlier. And so I began to read that and meditate on it and remembered my life from June 1986 to June 1987. And that was a year in my life, that was before I knew most of you here, where I went through what's commonly called burnout. I've been in this ministry six years and uh, gave all of my energy and 
as much time as I could to it. I didn't know a lot about ministry back then, especially about spiritual warfare. And I didn't realize in the, I was in the midst of real spiritual warfare until years later. But that time was difficult. It was a burnout where I got burned out. In other words, uh, I became so weak physically, emotionally, and even spiritually. Uh, yeah, I even had thoughts of ending my life. That's how depressed I was. And, or wishing at least my life would end. And the Lord had a purpose in all that. He was teaching me some valuable lessons that I wouldn't have learned any other way. And that's what, again, trials, suffering, conflict, even with other people. We don't, hopefully, want conflict with other people, but it's going to come too. We've all lived long enough that you're going to have conflict with people sometimes. It may have nothing to do with you. You may have done nothing wrong, not hurt them, but they just uh, have an attitude, so to speak. Why does God allow that? Well, he's trying to teach you, he's trying to teach me lessons, spiritual lessons especially, that we'll learn nowhere else, or no way else. Do you know what I'm talking about? How many know what I'm talking about? Raise your hands. Yeah. What well, was on that day, April 28, 2015, the Lord reminded me that in my now almost 40 years of following Him, there's been a pattern that almost every 10 years since 1986 and even before, every 10 years or so has been a difficult time for me. It all began in 1976, where I was still not a born-again Christian, not a follower of Christ, and I had great depression back then too. Depression because I was trying to live for myself, and I was very unhappy. So finally, God got a hold of me. I stopped running or trying to run from him, and I was born again, September 28, 1977. Well, then I got to thinking, 1977 to 1986, that's about 10 years, that's when I went through the burnout. Then I got to thinking, 1996, 10 years after the burnout, that's when my first wife, Kathy, got cancer. And being married to her, I struggled along with her, not with the actual illness, of course, but to see her die slowly over the course of nine years. That was a difficult time for me. And, uh, but again, the Lord was humbling me. The Lord was teaching me lessons. See, I have a real problem with pride. And it's very easy for me to lift myself up in my own mind and think, you know, I'm pretty important. <laughs> and so God has to keep knocking me down. By the way, there's two ways to be humbled. And I would suggest you do the easy way. Humble yourself. Scripture says that several times. Humble yourself. Because if you don't humble yourself, guess who will? God. And I've experienced that that's painful, usually. But it doesn't have to be that way if we're aware of the fact that we need to humble ourselves all the time. To actually say, I am nothing. I'm not saying in a derogatory sense because the balance of that is we are wonderfully made. And if we're a follower of Christ, He does think more than we ever could think about ourselves. We're jewels to him, right? We're his chosen people, right? Amen. So in that sense, it's good to say yes. But even that, we have to say it's because of Jesus, right? Yes. It's nothing I've done. 
that merits God's love. No, he just loved me because he loves me unconditionally. But on the flip side of that, we have to remember, I'm also got a wicked heart. The Apostle Paul said at the end of his life, maybe one of the greatest followers of Christ that ever lived, he said, I am the chief of sinners. Present tense. He didn't say I was, or I used to be. He said, I am. Present tense. Which means, what I see into that, is he got closer to the Lord, and isn't this true? The closer you get to the Lord, the more you see how far you are away from him. That's, that's what light does. He is the light. And the closer we get to the light, the more his light shines in those dark crevices of our heart. And says, see Daniel, you still have evil here. Don't think so much about yourself. That's the ways of God. And so, so that time period where my first wife uh, contracted and slowly died of cancer. In fact, she went to be with the Lord in 2006, 2000, actually 2007. Well, then I got to thinking, okay, every 10 years, if this is true in my life, when's the next one coming? <laughs> 2016. That would be the next 10 year interval. So I'm not looking to suffer, <laughs> but honestly, as I sat there with the Lord for a long time and have thought about this since, you know, maybe, maybe something's going to happen this year to me. I don't know what. Uh, my life is in his hands, right? Uh, if he wants to, well, he can do anything he wants with me. Inflict me with an illness. Take me home, I wouldn't be too sad about that. But that's this pattern that I've seen. And why do I share that with you? Because I want to share with you some thoughts, what I'm entitling, Why the Lord Breaks Our Hearts. Why the Lord Breaks Our Hearts. If you had your heart broken, in one way or another. Well, Jeremiah did. And if you want to turn with me to Lamentations 3. Matthew, could you please turn off the lights? They're behind that door. Please. All of them? All of them in this room, yes. There you go. Thank you. Why the Lord breaks our hearts. You know, Lamentations 3, that's one of my favorite portions of Scripture. In fact, Jeremiah is the figure in the Bible I most identify with. You ever thought about that? What person in the Bible you maybe most identify with? Think about that sometime. But why did God allow this to happen to Jeremiah's life? Lamentations 3, it's after his book in his, by his name, Jeremiah. You know what a lament is, don't you? Someone laments, they're complaining. They're hurting. And uh, it's a term we don't use often in the English language anymore, but it's basically complaints. And there's a whole bunch of series of complaints in this book. And as you read this, you begin to discover that Jeremiah needed to be humble, as we all do. Let's pick up at verse 1. This is Jeremiah speaking. I am the man that has seen affliction. By the rod of his wrath, and he means God. He, God, has led me and brought me into darkness, but not into light. Surely against me he has turned 
He turns his hand against me all the day. Get that. All the day. He feels God is against him. This is God's prophet here. This is a man who was denying himself already to follow God. And that's what makes these complaints even more, to me, emphatic. Verse 4, my flesh and my skin has he made old. He has broken my bones. He has builded against me and compassed me with gall and travail. He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. He has hedged me about that I cannot get out. He has made my chain heavy. Also when I cry and shout, he shuts out my prayer. Have you ever prayed and it doesn't seem like God is listening? That's happened to me more than once. Those times that I was suffering, those intervals, I was crying out to God, deliver me. I don't like this. But it was like he wasn't listening. We'll see why he takes us through those times. Nine. He has enclosed my ways with hewn stone. He has made my paths crooked. He was unto me as a bear lying in wait and as a lion in secret places. He has turned aside my ways and pulled me in pieces. He has made me desolate. He has bent his bow and set me as a mark for the arrow. He has caused the arrows of his quiver to enter into my reins. I was a derision to all my people and their song all the day, their mocking song. His own people mocked him. If you know the story of Jeremiah, he was preaching and his own people wanted him dead because they didn't like what he was preaching. They hated him for it. Verse 15, he, God, has filled me with bitterness. He has made me drunken with wormwood. He has also broken my teeth with gravel stones. He has covered me with ashes. And thou hast removed my soul far off from peace. He didn't have any peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope is perished from the Lord. Remembering my affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. Wow. He doesn't sound very happy to me. He's lamenting. He's complaining. And he's complaining to God. And he's, can I use the word, accusing God? Of all this trouble in his life. Read the book of Jeremiah. And you'll see he was imprisoned. Like I said, he was mocked. He just suffered terribly. In fact, God told him before he started his ministry, Jeremiah, I want you to preach everything I tell you to preach, but I'm telling you right now, no one's going to listen. How's that for encouragement? Even before he started, no one's going to listen to you. By the way, that's what makes these men of God that much more godly, is they didn't let that stop them. Noah, think of Noah, building the ark. It said he preached while he built that ark. Look who listened to him, his own family, only his family. He preached for over a hundred years. He would have been called a failure in the church growth movement. Come on, Noah, get a rock band. You know, serve food, hand out freebies. That will attract people. No, he just preached God's word. No one listened but his own family. That's why I think his rewards will be even greater than... Well, he'll have great rewards for his faithfulness. Whereas Paul, even though he suffered much, he saw much fruit. Churches were started, people got saved. The apostles in Jerusalem, 3,000 got saved one day. How's that for revival? That would encourage all of us, wouldn't it? <laughs> Jeremiah never saw that. No one ever saw that. But they still preached anyway. Well, why did all this happen? Verse 20 tells us. Lamentations 3.20. My soul hath him still in remembrance and is what? Humble in me. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. He 
had to be humble. Verse 22, these famous words. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because of his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Here, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching by way of video or in this room today, here is the only way to deal with discouragement, frustration, persecution, illness, rejection, abandonment, all the maladies that we might experience in this life. These, this is God's way. Summed up right here. We must hope in the Lord. We must wait on the Lord. And then we must seek the Lord. And again, verse 26 sums it up all so much beautifully. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. You know, when I was going through these different intervals of correction and difficulty, I kept saying, Lord, uh, when is this going to end? Don't you think I've had enough? <laughs> you know, I really don't like this. Uh, and if you're not going to remove this from me, just remove me from the earth. See, I wasn't quietly waiting. I was fussing. You ever fuss? You ever say, Lord, you know, I don't like this yoke. I don't like this burden. I don't like this person I have to live with. I don't like this roommate. I don't like this house parent. I don't like this boss. I don't like this spouse. I don't like this child. I don't like my brothers or my sisters. I don't like the other people at church. And we want God to remove all of them. For some reason, we think we're the only one that's right. No, we're causing grief to people as well. As I've often said, next to the Bible, God uses people to help us become more like Jesus than any other tool. People. But that's why some people flee to try to be alone. They become secluded because they just can't deal with people. Or they'll deal with people as little as possible. I know people like that. That's not God's way, unless He's leading you to do that, but uh, people I know that are doing that, they're doing it to run from God. They're like Jonah. They think they can run from God. In case you don't know this, you can't run from God. He'll maybe let you run, but He'll catch you. He's always caught me. Sometimes he has to tackle us <laughs> to get our attention. In a sense, he had to do this with Jeremiah. But here's the, uh, here's the solution. And notice who's the object of our hope and our waiting and our seeking. It's not the government. Don't put your hope in the government. They're going to fail. And they're not going to be here. I believe our country, the U.S., is not going to be like this very much longer. We're in for a lot of trouble. So you better be training yourself now to hope in the Lord. Because what if all the money is taken away? I heard a report the other day from a secular <coughs> expert, made no claim to be a follower of Christ. He said the money that the paper we have in our hands is not going to be worth what it says it's worth in very long. Our government just keeps printing to take care of the debt. Well, the debt gets bigger, and the money is worth less. So if the Social Security checks stop coming, if you can't have a job anymore, where are you going to go? You better start learning, and I better start learning, to trust in the Lord. Because if we do, He's promised you'll never go hungry. 
Right? It may not be steak and lobster. It may be peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, but you will not go hungry. Jesus said, be content with food and clothing. He didn't even say housing. Be content with food and clothing. And then we must wait on the Lord, wait on Him, not only to do what He wants to do in our hearts, but also when He's ready to lift the trouble, He'll lift it. I will suggest this, the sooner you and I learn what He's trying to teach us, the sooner He'll lift the tools He's using to try to humble us. And then we must seek the Lord. And again, the most, what, the primary way, the most important way, the, the most, the best way you can seek the Lord is in this book. Read it. Study it every day. Every day. And don't tell me you don't have the time. That is a lie. Christians say to me, followers of Christ, I don't have the time to read the Bible, pastor. Did you watch TV this week? Yeah, how long? Oh, about six or eight hours. Uh-huh. Yeah. Don't tell God you don't have the time. That's, that's an insult to Him. And it's a lie. Well, I don't understand it. Believe me, if you make the effort to read it, God will give you understanding, even if it's just a little bit, every day. I read the Bible sometimes, and yeah, I don't get a lot out of it. But if I'm paying attention, I'll get something. Even if it's just a little morsel. Sometimes it's like steak and lobster. Right? Sometimes it's just maybe bread and water, but that's okay. Uh, bread and water is good for you too. Well, Jeremiah continues his complaints. This is a little interlude here that we just talked about. Look at verse 27. It is good for a man that he uh, bear the yoke in his youth. He sits alone and keeps silent because he has borne it upon him. He puts his mouth in the dust. If so be, there may be hope. He gives his cheek to him that smites him. He is filled full of reproach. Look at verse 31. The Lord will not cast off forever. Though he cause grief, yet he will have compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. That's where waiting on the Lord comes. We may think relief is never coming. You know, when my first wife had that cancer, we prayed over and over and over again. She must have tried 25 different chemotherapies. I was taking her to her chemotherapy treatments two or three times a week. Thus, also, multiple surgeries. We thought the cancer was gone in this part of her body, then it appeared in her brain. Then that began to shrink, then it came up in her liver. That was being treated, then it came in her spine. And if you saw her near the end of her life, you know, she was petite anyway, but she was about 60 pounds. And she finally lowered her. And we prayed, we fasted, we had her anointed by the elders. We tried diets, we tried some unusual remedies that people told us. Get this, this is a little sideline here, I don't mean to gross you out. But one person told us, do this. Have her drink her own urine. Uh, she never did that. <laughs> But uh, we try many different ways. But you know what? In the end, God didn't want her healed. And it wasn't because of sin. God just didn't want her healed. And so, when the Lord took her, she had a smile on her face. She was in our home. And... Uh, Her sister, older sister, had just visited her for a couple hours and went home about 11 or 12. The children, Matthew and Rachel, were in their beds upstairs. I went into the living room for a little while. And 
thought it was time for me to go to bed, so I went into where she was and I said, Good night, Kathy. And no response. So then I went over to her face and didn't hear any breathing. Put my hand by her nose and her mouth, didn't feel any breathing. And uh, I knew the Lord had taken her. And uh, she had a smile on her face. And uh, that was a little message from the Lord, I think, that uh, she was in a much better place. But the point is, uh, we, we prayed, we tried everything we could possibly do to bring her healing. But just in the end, it wasn't God's will. And during that time, I had to learn, and still learning, but had to learn to wait on Him and to seek Him. Well, Jeremiah goes on. 33. He does not afflict willingly or grieve the children of men to crush under his feet all the prisoners of the earth. Verse 35. To turn aside the right of the man before the face of the Most High. To subvert a man in his cause. The Lord approves not. Who is he that says it comes to pass when the Lord commands it not? Out of the mouth of Most High proceeds not evil and good. Wherefore does a living man complain? A man for the punishment of his sins? Ah, but verse 40. This is another reason why calamity will come. Let us search and try our hearts and our ways and turn again to the Lord. You see that? In the midst of these complaints, these laments, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Jeremiah writes this. I must search and try my ways. Is there anything in my life that shouldn't be there? A habit, a practice, thoughts, bitterness, anger, revenge, not loving our enemies like we should and are commanded to, having difficulty relating to someone in our life, not liking our financial status, whatever it might be. Affliction is meant to do this. Look at what he says in verse 41. Let us lift up our heart with our hands unto God in the heavens. We have transgressed. We have rebelled. Thou hast not pardoned. Thou hast covered with anger and persecuted us. Thou hast slain and thou hast not pitied. Thou hast covered thyself with a cloud. There he talking about again. God seems far away that our prayers should not pass through. By the way, if God seems far away, guess who moved? You did. And I did. Scripture says, if we're a follower of Christ, He lives in us. But yes, I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like for God to seem far away. That He's not hearing my prayers, that He doesn't care about my plight, and that I just have to suffer. Day after day, day after day, day after day. And uh, He seems far away. But if he seems far away, it's because we've moved. The point is, during these times of trouble and suffering, if we are hoping in him, waiting on him, and seeking him, the good news is he'll come even closer. That's the testimony of the follower of Christ that is responding in a righteous way to trouble. God will seem closer than he ever has. We just saw that movie, Bless You Prison. Those of us at Butterworth, remember her? Final testimony, four years in prison, I, God has never felt closer, she was able to say. And that was a cruel prison, you saw that, in communist Romania. Beat her, starved her, mistreated her, abused her, mocked her, four years. But she was able to say, bless you prison, because God has never seen closer. See, our tendency, human nature, is to run from conflict, run from suffering, and all that. And sometimes we're supposed to. But sometimes we're just to wait and sit and let God do His work. Because you know what? If we run and He allows us to run like Jonah, He just has to send a harder taskmaster. Right? Again, learn the lesson now. Don't, you know, maybe all He needs, figuratively speaking, is a stick. 
Don't be like me, stubborn, where he has to use a two by four. Right? Yeah. Well, Jeremiah goes into lamenting about his enemies. As we go on here, we won't read them all. Look at verse 46. All our enemies have opened their mouths against us. Look at 48. My eye runs down with rivers of water. That means he was crying a lot. Verse 51, my eye affects my heart because of all the daughters of my, my city. Now here he's associating with Jerusalem and Judea, who is now under attack by the Babylonians. And Babylonians were not very nice. By the way, uh, much of ISIS, they come from those people. The Babylonians, the Syrians. Same people as Israel dealt with back then. They didn't like Israel then, they don't like Israel now. They didn't like followers of Christ, well they weren't followers of Christ back then. They didn't like, they didn't like godly people then, they don't like godly people now. Verse 53 it actually ends up in a dungeon, a literal dungeon. Water's flowing over his head, verse 54. I'm cut off. Verse 55, I call on your name, O Lord, out of the low dungeon. But look at the good news now. Verse 56, you heard my voice. Hide not your ear from my breathing and my cry. That, that's a picture of all he could do was breathe. Have you ever been that sad, that depressed, that lonely, where you can't even speak? You just, you just say, oh, God. Or, well, hmm. You know, oh, oh. Many of the psalmists got to that point. They couldn't even speak. They just groaned. But here's verse, 50, verse 57. Thou drewest near in the day that I called upon thee. Thou saidest, fear not. Thou drewest near in that day. You said, fear not. So why does God break our hearts? Why does he have to break our hearts? Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. David wrote that. Then the psalmist in Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Contrite means broken too. Bottom line, God is closest to us when we're suffering the most. Think about it. When everything's going well, we have a tendency to forget, forget about God. Am I the only one with that problem? No. That's human nature too. And that's why we can even do what Paul the Apostles suggested from a prison cell. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. He didn't write that from a palace. He wrote that from a prison cell. And not a prison cell like we have in Michigan. I love this little diagram someone put together. The beauty of brokenness. By the way, I have all this on handouts if you want one of these. But this is so true. The difference between proud people and broken people. Proud people focus on the failures of others. Broken people overwhelmed with their own need. Proud people look down on others. Broken people esteem others better than themselves. Proud people, independent, self-sufficient, broken, recognizes the needs of others. Proud people need to control. Everything must be their way. Broken people surrenders control, especially to God. Proud people have to prove they are always right. 
Broken people yield their right to be right. Falsely accused. Not having to defend yourself. Just if, if you're in a place where you can't defend yourself like Jesus was before the Sanhedrin, you know, they're keeping all those lies upon him, he just remained silent. He yielded his right to be right and to express it. They're always claiming their rights to proud people. Broken people are yielding their rights. Proud people always demand. Broken people, humble people, possess a giving spirit. Proud people desire to be served. Broken people are motivated to serve others. Proud people have a desire to be a success. Broken people desire to make others a success. Proud people, they're proud of what they know. Humble people, they know they need to learn more. Proud people are self-conscious. Humble people, broken people, not concerned with self at all. Proud people, defensive when criticized. Broken people, receive criticism humbly. Oh, this is so hard. Human nature, defend yourself, right? No. Christ-like nature, keep your mouth shut and just leave it to the Lord. Quick to blame others. Humble people can see where they are wrong. Proud people, unapproachable. Broken, easy to be entreated. Proud, don't see their need to repent. Broken people, quick to repent. Proud people, difficult saying, difficulty saying, I was wrong, will you forgive me? As Bill Gothard says, the seven hardest words in the English language. Seven hardest words to speak. I was wrong, will you forgive me? Humble people are quick to admit their failure and seek forgiveness if needed. Finally, this diagram, journey to the cross. And notice for a reason, it's the arrow goes down. The cross is down. This is the attitude that Paul and Jesus had. We don't have time to look it up in scripture. But Paul and Jesus both by God's grace and others abusing them and persecuting them, they went down. No confidence in the flesh, emptied themselves, count all things as lost, bond servants, suffered the loss of all things, humbled himself, given the right to achieve righteousness, obedience, fellowship with their sufferings, willing to be weak, weak willing to die, conformed to his death. Galatians 2.20. And so... It's the same way for us. The cross. The cross is not a symbol. It can be a symbol of triumph. But it's really a symbol of suffering. Is it not? Well, as most of you know, at this joint service, we always like to ask this question. As this new year begins, this is a question that's asked all the time by the Lord. In fact, every day, all during the day. Who are you and I going to serve in 2016? There's only two choices. One is self, the world, and the devil. Or it is the Lord. I like that phrase, either Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. He's not Lord 90%, 95%. You know, otherwise, he's not the Lord. But this is really a daily commitment. This, I'm going to ask you to come up here and sign this if you're willing to. And you know what? We encourage you to do this. Uh, I made copies of this, of the signatures, circle yours, give it to you on a piece of paper. And we encourage you to put it in a place where you can see it predominantly throughout the year. Uh, I put mine on the bathroom mirror. 
if you can, if you don't have that permission to do that, you can put it somewhere in your quiet time where you're going to see it every day or often. So now again, when I say this, I'm not asking you to make a vow. Although if you want to make it a vow, there's nothing wrong with making vows. The Bible just says if you make a vow, you better keep it because he has no pleasures in fools. So many people, they, they promise this, they promise that, and they don't do it. Uh, that's why the Bible says, always say the Lord willing, we'll do this or that. So, uh, can we have the lights again there, Matthew, please? Now, the staff in the kitchen will have the privilege to, hold on a second. No, you can have a seat. I just had to say goodbye to everyone watching on YouTube. God, God bless you. Thanks for listening.